Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are here for you. We are here for you. Let your breath come from heaven. Fill our hearts with your life. We are here for you. We are here for you. To you our hearts are open. To you our hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. You alone are holy. Only you are worthy. God, let your fire fall down. Let our shout. Let our shout. your word move in power let what's dead come to life we are here for you we are here for you to you our hearts are open to you our hearts are open nothing here is hidden you are one desire Father, you are the one that we have come to meet. Yes, Lord, fellowship was a part of your church, and we love our fellowship with one another. We love our friendships. But, Lord, uh, our faith and our church is not based on those things. Our, Our faith in our church is based on you. Lord, we love you. We want fellowship with you. And Lord, we come before you and Lord, you know, we ask that you would just touch our hearts with your Holy Spirit. Lord, forgive us, cleanse us, fill us fresh and new. Lord, open our hearts to you all that you would have for us. Tonight we're going to learn wonderful nuggets of truth and wisdom. And may we be open to all that you'd have. So may our worship be a time of praise and adoration, but also a time for your spirit to stir up the soil to receive your word. So we just commit this time to you, Lord, in Jesus' name.
thousand times I've failed, still your mercy remains. And should I stumble again, still I'm caught in your grace. And the last day, your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all fame. In my heart. My heart and my soul, Lord, I give you control. Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out. Everlasting, your light will shine when all. song because I just identify with that first line a thousand times I fail and a thousand times you've forgiven Lord where sin abounds grace much more abounds and we're so grateful Lord that we can come to you and repent we just pray Lord that your Holy Spirit would convict us so that our, our time between the fail and the repentance short and not long Lord we want to be on our tippy toes when you would whisper in our ears what you want of us Lord you are my strength my all in all, seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool, you are my all in all, Jesus.
sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, bless your name, you are my all.
Oh, Lord. The truth of the matter is, that's all we can do, Lord, is imagine. Your word has said that eye has not seen nor ear heard nor has entered in the heart of man. And that scripture blows my mind because when we take the accumulation of everything that you've said in your word, Old Testament and New Testament, about heaven, the little glimpses we get about having a new body and what we can do and the things that we'll do in heaven and ruling and reigning and all these little things, you just all of that, we put it all together, Lord, and we're still looking through a dark glass. We still don't have just, we, we, don't, we don't see the magnitude of what you've prepared for those who love you, Lord, and we love you. And Father, when we see what's going on around our country and our world, you know, it makes, makes us think of how soon before Until that day, Lord, may we be found faithful servants doing your will, Lord, every day. Lord, we all want to hear it. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Lord, we want to hear those words. We want to see you smile on us. So, Lord, help.
Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy. I spent a little while today thinking again about those promises. You know, Lord, and one of those great promises that you've given us, as you tell us there in John chapter 14, first and foremost, don't let your heart be troubled. Man, there are a lot of things around us today in this world that are quite troubling. Uh, We saw a few of those things last night, quite troubling. But Lord, we're not to let our hearts be troubled because we have a promise and your promise is is that one day you're going to come back for us because this is not our home and we're going to be swept away to our new home father in your father's house and so lord we just thank you for that promise tonight may it it just again may it assure our hearts may it comfort us lord may it bring us to peace to know that the journey doesn't end here it ends on the other side of this thing lord and we thank you for that We have a lot of needs represented here tonight. We want to lift them before you. We want to continue, Lord, this evening to pray for Gary. Lord, just that, you know, as uh, his back surgery is healing up, and then right after that surgery, he had to have heart surgery, Lord. We just pray that the energy and the strength would come back. We know that he kind of runs out of gas about midday. We just pray for him and for, uh, especially for Gil that's having to take care of him. Lord, we just lift them before you this evening. Pray for them, Lord want to continue to pray for John Kersey, Lord, and just as, you know, the viruses are going around our community, and apparently he's contracted, you know, one of those viruses that turned into pneumonia, Father, as you well know, and has been in and out of the hospital. We, we lift him before you tonight. We pray that you would heal his body. want to pray for Nathan tonight, Lord, as he and uh, his mom and dad, and Nick and uh, Ginger are down at the hospital prepping him father for tomorrow's surgery that corrective surgery needs to take place in that little young man we pray lord you just guide the surgeon's hands just bring complete health to him lord we pray and again for his grandma Lori, i just had uh Lori just had knee surgery pray for her want to pray for dennis and for chuck who just recovered from prostate surgery you know man lord if you don't come soon man i think our church is supporting the medical industry we, we just pray for these people tonight and then all the others that are sick with the flu and cold who are in that season. Pray for them, Lord. And just pray for every other need represented here this evening. And we do so in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's kids would say, amen. Spend a few moments greeting one another before you settle into your spot. Proverbs chapter 11. We've already prayed, but again, as we come through from chapter 10 to chapter 22 verse 16 there are 375 proverbs Uh, most theologians tell us that probably Solomon wrote 3,000 but we have about 375 before us and as we said last week when we came into chapter 10 they are comparative in nature which means that they're setting something in contrast in other words if you do what is right and you live righteously, you will be blessed. If you do what is wicked, and you live wickedly, then you're going to be cursed. And they're kind of those things that are set in opposition to each other. It's a lot like what Jesus said, you're either for me, or you're against me. 
You cannot serve two masters. You're either walking in the light or you're walking in darkness. And again, one of the things we saw as we're going through 1 John with the men on Monday night in chapter 1, John says, if you say that you have fellowship with the Father and you're walking in darkness, see there's a contrast there, then you lie and you do not the truth. So these are comparative uh, proverbs that are set before us so that we can learn from them. The first of those that we find in chapter 11 is a false balance is an abomination unto the Lord. But a just weight is his delight. Now, one of the things he's going to speak to this evening, and maybe some of you are, are here that own your own business, Maybe some of you here that work for an employer, it can, uh, it can work both ways. But what he's talking about is integrity in the workplace. You see, when we walk through Proverbs, literally, he will address every issue of life. And that there ought to be integrity, not just in the spiritual things, but in the physical things of our life. How we treat those people that we do business with. And one of the things he's saying here is that if you in these days that Jesus wrote uh, or lived or in the days that, the, that Solomon wrote, in the days that he lived, if you went down to the marketplace to buy something, you know, maybe uh, some wheat or some corn, they would weigh it out on a scale. And they would put, if you wanted a pound, they would put a pound weight on one side and then you would put a pound of grain. You still go to sometimes and buy things at the store this way. And so that you knew that you got a pound of whatever it is that you were purchasing. Well, one of the things that they would do is they would change the weights. They would make the weights heavier so that you really didn't get, or lighter, so you really didn't get a pound in some way they could rip you off, and there was no integrity in the business. You know, I've, I've owned businesses. I've ran businesses. One of the ways I supported myself, because I'm a church planter, this is the third Calvary Chapel that I planted for the Calvary Chapel movement. In fact, last weekend, I forgot to announce it, that last weekend represented the 25th year that we started this church. I've been here 25 years and, uh, and I'll tell you, I looked a lot different when we started this than I do now. I can, I, I've gone back and seen pictures. Um, but I had a business. And when I moved here, I started a, a heating and air conditioning business. And we went from number 33. There were 33 contractors in town to number three in just a few years. And we met with one of our suppliers. And, you know, he was asking me some questions. Well, the first thing I told him was, is I'll tell you the secret if you will share it with all the other contractors. He said, I wouldn't do that. And I said, no, no, you have to promise me that if you, if I tell you what the, um, the secret is to the success of our business, because they were wondering down at Schlakey Brothers in Yuba City because they saw the product that we moved from the time we started in three years, we were right up to number three. And I told him, I said, I will tell you the secret. I'd be glad to tell you the secret if you will tell everyone else. And I made the salesman promise me that he would. He took me out to lunch, and I said, the secret is Jesus. He started laughing. We were at Maria's. He starts laughing out loud. I said, no, I'm telling you the truth. The secret is Jesus because my partner and I, we serve the Lord. We walk in integrity in our business. And what that means is we do what we said we were going to do at the time that we said we were going to do it for how much we said we were going to do it, exactly what we said we were going to do, and we don't give you less, we give you more. Because the Bible commands us to have integrity in our business. Now, for example, there was a lady that I went out and I bid the job, and I've shared this with other people in our church that have businesses. I went out and I bid the job, and she had several other bids, and we got the contract, and so we went out and we did the work, and at the end of every job, I would walk with the customer through it, show her the ducting, anything that you don't understand about that, show her the unit, how the thermostat operated, and then at the end, we would go over the contract, and if there were any questions, this was the time to ask. And we get to the end of it, and she says to me, well, where are my electrostatic filters? And I looked at the contract, and I said, well, th there was no mention. I even looked through my notes. There was no mention of any kind of uh, purifying device in your return area. You just, and I said, but if you think that we, she goes, well, you're trying to rip me off. And I said, I wouldn't rip you off for the world. I said, if you think that 
we promised you two electrostatic filters, then let me run back to the shop. I'll be right back. Don't sign the check. Just wait. I went to the shop, and when I came back, she had reviewed all of the bids that she got, and she said, you know, the last guy that was here before you, he talked me out of it, the electrostatic filters. He said they were too restrictive. I had the notes, and I didn't mention it with you. And so you were wrong. I gave her the filters anyway. And our cost was like $125 a piece, but I gave her the filters anyway. She goes, no, no, no. I said, no, no. If you thought that we had promised you something, we didn't give. Listen, they're yours. I've already opened them up and put them in. They're yours. She got me three more jobs on her cul-de-sac. Walk in integrity in your business practices. Because Proverbs tells us that a false scale, when you're deceiving or ripping somebody off in your business practices, when you're not walking in integrity, because again, remember we said last week, we're looking at some of these things, that whatever you, your hands find to do, do it and do it as unto the Lord. You're really not working for your employer. You're not working for the people if you own a business. You're working for the Lord, and the Lord is watching. And here he tells us that false balances, deception, and business practices is an abomination unto him. But then he, in contrast, he says, but a just weight, someone who walks in integrity, that is honest in his business practices, he tells us here it is his delight. It delights the heart of the Father. Secondly, verse 2, when pride cometh, and how many never have struggled in their whole life with pride? The ones that didn't raise their hand, you're proud. No, we all, listen, listen, there are three areas, listen carefully, that John tells us, the last living apostle, he tells us that we're going to struggle in. You know that. They've, everything that you will struggle in as a Christian will fall in one of these three categories. The lust of the flesh. The lust of the eye or the pride of life. Either you're going to have a problem with sexual sin, you're going to struggle with, you know, knowing how to possess this vessel as a vessel of honor, sanctified unto the Lord, that will be your struggle, or your struggle will be in material things. You know, the, the things of this world, you get way too attached to those things. In fact, you begin to covet those things. In fact, they become uh, idols. They can become idols to us if we're not careful, the things of the world, or the pride of life. Now, the very nature of pride, if you didn't know that, uh, the very nature of pride is that you have an unteachable spirit. Because when pride comes, what it does is it, it so settles in on us in a very deceptive way so that we think that we know when we may not. In fact, when we get to chapter 13, verse 10, Proverbs is going to tell us that only by pride comes contention. And so in, in relationships, in marriage, in church, if there's contention, pride is at the center of it. And pride's at the center of contention because you think that you're right. And you can't hear somebody else's side of the matter. And yet the Bible tells us a wise man has the capacity to hear both sides of the case before he comes to a conclusion, before he settles the matter in his heart. So here, Solomon in his proverb in this verse says, when pride cometh, when you allow it to grab a hold of you, then cometh shame. That's what pride will produce, shame. But with the lowly is wisdom. And the word for lowly there can also be translated from the Hebrew, the meek, uh, the humble. And that characteristic, when it's found in the life of a believer, uh, it has the idea of having a teachable spirit. In fact, the word for meekness in the New Testament in the Greek is the same word for domesticating a wild animal. So he lays up before us in a contrast, the proud man, when pride comes, won't listen. 
Uh, the proud man doesn't seek counsel. The proud man won't listen to counsel, but he thinks he already knows. But the humble man will become wise because he has a teachable spirit. And in the multitude of counselors, every purpose is going to be established. He seeks wisdom. He gains wisdom. He grows in wisdom. And so here we're admonished not to allow pride to take hold. In fact, in James, in the New Testament, chapter 4, verses 5 through 6, this is what it says. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain? The spirit that dwelleth in us, it lusts to envy. Now, there's a conflict in us. And, you know, when we're envying people, that's, that's, that's also a product of pride. But listen to what he says. But speaking of the Lord, but he giveth more grace. You know, at those moments when you're struggling with pride, seek the Lord. And the Bible says that he gives more grace. Watch this. Wherefore he saith, this is the Lord speaking, wherefore he saith, God resists the proud. Now, pride, pride is not just a bad thing. In fact, when we went to Proverbs chapter 6, you remember that six things, the Lord hates the seventh is an abomination to him. One of those six things is a proud look. And then it talks about a haughty spirit. God resists the proud. But he says that he gives grace to the humble favor against men and again James puts it in contrast pride or humility stubbornness or a teachable spirit and by the way if you have a teachable spirit here Solomon says you will attain wisdom wisdom comes through a teachable spirit you know we had Dr. Dave Hawking here uh, last week, and you know, he taught the men's one day conference. He taught Friday night, and he taught again on Sunday. And and uh, you know, one of the things being around David Hawking is you realize that this man is a scholar. In fact, some of the newer translations you'll see Hawking says in a footnote, "That's Dave Hawking. He truly is a scholar." And there have been many times over thirty some odd years that I've known him. I remember Colin and I thirty some odd years ago. In fact. Dave Hawking actually remembered when we had him out at the last church I pastored, a couple other churches in the area, we had invited him to come and speak that I took him out to dinner one night, and uh, he walks in, uh, my wife and I are sitting at the table, we're already there, and he literally picked me up and moved me, chair and all, he was, you know, Dave Hawking back in the day was, you know, he's like 6'6", six, six, 300 pounds and not fat. And he moved me aside, and he sat between me and my wife, and we had about an hour conversation. And in that hour, as I listened and asked a few questions, he literally changed the course of my ministry and my view of what the church should be like and what we should be about just in an hour conversation as I listened to the wisdom of this man. And I've got to sit at the table of a lot of wise men. And I believe that's why God gave us two ears and one mouth. We should listen twice as much as we speak. Because if you will listen and have a teachable spirit, if you allow God to speak to you through other people, if you can come to that place to realize you don't know everything, and don't think that you do, but listen with a heart to learn. Don't listen just with the idea that you're going to answer or rebut, but listen with a heart to learn. You will learn some things. So again, he tells us, when pride cometh, then comes shame. But with the lowly, the humble, the teachable is wisdom. Verse 3, the integrity of the upright shall guide them. Now, I love this verse because, again, integrity is uh, kind of a, um, another way of saying your character. And what he's going to talk to us about in this verse here is that godly character. As we're allowing the word of God to be formed in us. And we are taking on, because Christ is being formed in us through the word, we're taking on the nature and the character of our father. And so we walk in holiness. We walk in integrity. We walk in godly character is the idea here. Listen to what he says. The integrity of the upright shall guide them. When, 
When you allow the word of God, like David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee, O God. When your heart is to seek the wisdom and the knowledge and the character of our Father, that we would emulate Him, that we would become like Him. And how we think and what we say, where we go, how we behave, that as we study the Word of God, we allow the Word of God to be so formed in us that we take on the nature and the character of our Father. So that in every situation, it's almost like a default. You know, your computers have a default. The default is always to behave in a godly way. This is what Solomon is saying. So hide the word of God in your heart. So walk as a man of integrity. So be a man that takes upon the nature and character of the Father, so filled with the Holy Spirit that your default, whenever you find yourself in a, in a tough situation, your default is truth. Your default is to behave like the Father. The integrity of the upright, it guides him. The wise man knows when to speak and when not to speak. The wise man knows where to go and where not to go. The wise man knows what to listen to and what not to listen to. The wise man and the wise woman have taken on the heart and the nature, the character of the Father, and that integrity, it guides them. It keeps them on that narrow path. It keeps them from temptation and from destruction because you've hidden these things in your heart. We don't study the word, listen, just so it goes into our head. It has to permeate our whole being. Just like it was said of Jesus, the word became flesh. The word needs to become flesh in us. So that when you find yourselves in those tough situations, I love what's going on on Monday night with the guys. We're memorizing verses. And there are verses that have to do, especially when we go into the second section, we're going to be starting next week, when we get into that section on temptation. When these things come our way, because we've been memorizing and hiding God's word in our heart, that pops up, and it changes the way we react to certain things. So listen to what he's saying. He says, listen, the integrity of the upright, it guides them, but the perverseness, the wickedness, the crookedness, if you will, um, of a transgressor, one who violates God's law, one who violates God's commandments, shall destroy them. No successful sin. And so again, Solomon puts in contrast, if you allow the word of God to wash over you, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, if you're walking in, te in integrity and in godly character, if you're walking in righteousness and in holiness before the Lord as you're setting your heart to know and to obey his word, those things will guide you. But if you are perverse in heart and you willfully transgress God's laws, then your sin will destroy you. Now, when we came for the first nine chapters, we have Solomon speaking to his son in these sermonettes. And man, one of the things he kept warning him for over and over is the brazen woman, the temptress that would try to lead him away into a sexual sin. And he was talking about how the word of God would hide his, if you hide it in your heart, it will keep you from that woman as you walk in integrity. And so whatever temptation uh, that you um, have to endure, whatever comes your way as you're traveling this narrow road as a, a follower of Christ, uh, the, here the Bible says that if you will allow godly character to be formed in you. If you'll walk in integrity, it will guide you through and it will help you to navigate through those very difficult times. But somebody who doesn't give themselves to these things is perverse, a transgressor. Listen, he, he will be destroyed. His sin will destroy him. You know, true story, I went to my fifth high school uh, uh, reunion. I went to my 10th. I went to my 15th. And I went to my 20th, and when we left the, the restaurant, the uh, banquet place where they had it, I looked at my wife and said, I won't go to the 25th. And she said, why? And I said, because a lot of the guys that I graduated high school aren't here, and they're not here because they couldn't make it. They're not here because they're dead. And look around at the people that are here. Some of these people look like they're twice my age. 
and no teeth. Because drugs and alcohol and living a life of debauchery, which I was right involved in in high school. None of them guys outstepped me in debauchery in high school. But I got saved in the early years of college. I came to Christ. And Christ changed me. And I told my wife on the way home, in fact, I shared with the men on Monday night, I would probably be in prison if Christ didn't save me. Because I was an angry, violent man. I probably would have been married three or four times. Because my bent wasn't to godliness and holiness. Christ rescued me. He put his Holy Spirit in me. He put a hunger in me for his word. And then when I would study his word, he placed his word in such a way in me that it began to overshadow the flesh and it became the default for my behavior, which is righteousness and holiness. And I just told my wife, I can't come again. I can't not go to the 30th. I can't go to the 35th or the 40th. They just had our 45th. And I saw pictures because they posted them on Facebook. And it was a small group. And, man, I'm going to tell you, they looked rough. And I just thought, man, hey, ain't no way I'm going. And they looked rough. Now, you look at me and you say, well, you don't look so good. No, listen. I may look rough on the outside, but the, the man inside is being renewed day by day. Amen? The joy of the Lord. So, again, you know, we're not going to get through this chapter, are we? We're in verse 3. Okay, verse 4, riches, and these are standalone proverbs, by the way, so we can stop at any point. Riches profit not in the day of wrath or in the day of judgment. Listen, he's warning us, don't live your life. It's the second one of those categories that First John tells us about in chapter 2 when he looks at the categories of sin. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life. And how many Christians will say, well, you know, I know sexual sin is wrong, so I avoid that. And, and I know that pride is wrong, so I, I want to have a teachable spirit. But you can fall into materialism. In fact, if you're not very careful, that thing can grab a hold of your heart and lead you away. You know, every once in a while, and I can kind of fall into it. I mean, I remember uh, when, when I wanted to start fishing, and, and we had a yard sale here, and somebody brought an aluminum boat, just an aluminum boat. They didn't have a motor and trailer, nothing. And I, I looked at that, and I thought, that would be really cool to have. And so I had to buy that little boat. It was only 10 feet long. And then I got on eBay, and I bought a motor, and then it fit in the back of the truck, and I got tired of hauling it in out of the back of the truck with a little motor, and I had to have a better boat. And so I bought a little bit bigger one. In fact, the same guy that sold me that one said, I have another one. I beat the dents out of it, painted it, and it, it didn't have a trailer, but I found one on eBay, and then I found a motor, and I put it together, and that was pretty good for a while, and then I had to have another boat. This time, I wanted one with a floor and carpeting. I wanted one that had a seat that I could set up, and you could operate the trolling motor because I like the bass fishing, and so I had to have all of that. Electric start, of course. Honda. Not one of them two strokes that stink you out. And finally, I sold that, and the Lord says, stop it. Because the flesh can never be saved. You need to just stop. And, you know, I thought, well, Lord, you're not going to make me get a cane pole and go sit on the bank, are you? But no, you just stop fishing. And so I had to give it up for a while because literally... I had to be on the lake once a week. When Kyle did the Tuesday night women's Bible study, guess where I was at? I did the Monday night men's Bible study. She did the Tuesday night women's Bible study. I was on one of the lakes here in town, especially in the summertime. It doesn't get dark at 930. And it began to take control. And listen, all things are lawful, but all things are expedient. All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. Paul says, I will be brought under the bondage of nothing. Be careful about the things of this world because they can become idols. And he tells us here, listen, riches profit not in the day of wrath or judgment, but righteousness. Now there's something you can invest in. Delivereth from death. We have almost an equivalent to this in the New Testament, and no doubt in Jesus being the living word, is thinking about this proverb as he is now saying this. What he says is, for what, for what is a man profited? Matthew 16, 26. What is a man profited? If he gains the whole world. 
everything your eye ever coveted, you got. If you gain the whole world and lost his own soul, or what shall a man give, in that day is the idea, in exchange for his soul? Again, true story, when I, when I got saved, I went home to my parents. My dad was an engineer. In fact, he was a very prestigious engineer. He was an engineer, um, a drilling and blasting engineer for the second largest construction company in the world. I mean, he helped build the air base in Israel. He's built dams in Chile. Uh, I mean, my dad was well known in the construction industry as an engineer. And, you know, I'm going to college. My dad told me all the time growing up, you could be the next president of the United States. Like, I'd want to do that. I just saw what Trump went through. Who wants to be the president of the United States? Are you kidding me? But my dad was very encouraging. And as I went off to secular college to first get through the first two years of just the general education, I got saved during that time. And, and so I took a break, and every summer I'd go to work for him because supervision could, we could, you know, join the labor union. He'd call me out of the hall. I could work 250 hours during the summer. I get my uh, health benefits. Then the company would give me a reduction, of course. And then also, um, as I drew unemployment, they would renew my unemployment so I could draw unemployment the whole nine months I'm in school. That's what Guy Ackeson offered. And when I went home after I got saved, I told my dad that I'm leaving secular college to go to Bible college. He literally took me by the nap of the neck and the seat of the pants, and he threw me out of the house. And he says, you're going to wreck your life. You're going to ruin your life. You're going to become nothing. You're, a, you're, going, to be a, you're going to account for nothing. And I'm not going to watch it. I love you, son, but I'm not going to have anything to do with that. Man, as long as you're dealing with this foolishness, I don't want anything to do with you. My dad and I were tight up until that moment. The only verse that could come to my head is, you know, um, I didn't come to bring peace but a sword, and it'll be in your own home. And sometimes when you choose to serve the Lord, it's going to cost you relationships. And I love my dad. And, you know, even though he was pretty rude to me, I kept going over to his house, and we would wind Destiny up when we had children, and we'd send her over with all the scriptures, and she would witness to my dad and witness to my mom. And, and one morning, you know, I would just come over uninvited. I came over at breakfast time, and we were at the kitchen table, and, and I got to lead my father to the Lord. I found out what the hang-up was and why he was so upset. And I got to lead my dad to the Lord, and six years later, I got to pastor him for six years. Six years later, he died from heart-related complications. And the last time I saw my dad, I maybe I've told you this story before, he says, son, I, I, ha I have something I need to tell you. And I said, well, what's that? And I knew he was in bad shape. He said, I want to tell you I'm sorry. I said, dad, we've been through this. You're fine. I'm fine. You're fine with the Lord. I'm fine with the Lord. We're okay. I know you're dying. I'm going to die someday too, but I can guarantee you. Then I went into my speech. When you die, you're going to step into eternity, and I'm going to miss you, but you're not going to miss me because time is going to accelerate. If there ever was to be a resurrection, it's already happened. It'll be like I'm already there. And so I go into this heaven speech that I give everybody when they're dying. He goes, no, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. You've given that speech already. I understand heaven and where I'm going. I understand all that. That's not what I'm talking about. I said something, and the Holy Spirit's convicted me of it. I need to get straight with you. And I said, what's that? He said, I told you 17 years ago that you'd be a failure and that you would waste your life. The truth of the matter is I'm the one who wasted my life. You didn't waste your life. You know, we're given it. It, it, we're guaranteed at most 70 years. If you get any more than that, it's God's grace. And I look at some of the people over 70, and I don't know that God's been so gracious. You know, I look at Carl, and I don't know. But if you get, if you get 70 years, that 70 years, listen to me. I want, I want to tell you something. <laughs> oh, Carl, God bless you, brother. Um, <laughs> never mind the man behind the curtain. Let me tell you something about this life. This life is a test. Remember you as a kid and you're watching your favorite cartoon and all of a sudden this weird pattern came on your TV and started making this weird noise and you wanted to get back to Woody Woodpecker or, you know, or Wiley Coyote or something and, and it came on and said, this is a test of the Emergency Broadcast Association. And then in case of an emergency, it told you some information where you to report and all that. And then finally the thing would go off and you could get back to your program. 
Well, let me tell you something, guys. This life is a test. That's all it is. It's not to be the main thing. As the Bible tells us, it's but a vapor. It's here one moment, and it's gone the next. The Bible tells us every good gift that you have has come from the Father of lights in whom there is no shadow of turning. Every good gift, all the currency in your life, and your life, by the way, is currency. You have time, you have energy, you have talent, you have resources. That is currency that God has given you. And how you spend that currency, you are going to be rewarded for it. If you spend all of your time, energy, and resources on the things of this life, the things that are temporal, the things that are not eternal, the things that are but for the moment, then the Bible says when you stand before the Lord, if you're a Christian, when you stand before Him, your life is going to be tried even as by fire. And when the fire is put to it because you've been given materials, wood, hay, and stubble, Gold, silver, precious stones, that which is done for the Lord are the permanent things. Those are things that are done for this earth and for you are the temporal things. The temporal things will be burned away. And the things that are of the Lord will remain. And the Bible says at that moment you're going to be rewarded for the things you've done for the Lord because we are to live for the Lord in this life. And the things that are temporal will be burned away. And he says some Christians will suffer the loss of it. They'll have nothing but their salvation. There are others who have so given over to the things of this world that they're not even saved. They don't want to give up the pleasures of this life. You know, one of the things about Moses, he understood. The Bible says that Moses would rather suffer with the children of God than to live a life of pleasure for a moment. He walked away as the prince of Egypt from all of that prestige and all of those benefits that would have come to him to suffer with the people of God. I'd rather suffer with the people of God standing on truth, spending my life and being spent for the things that are of God than to waste my life on the things of this world. And you can accumulate it all. None of it will do you any good when you stand before the Lord because here Solomon says, riches profit nothing. In the day of God's judgment, you came into this world with nothing, and I'm going to tell you, you're going to leave this world with nothing. And the only thing that's going to matter in between the birth and the death is what did you do for the Lord? Because then he says, listen carefully, but righteousness, it delivers from death. Live right, and not only will it deliver you to death, but you'll be blessed on the other side of this thing. Verse 5. Righteousness, the righteousness of a mature person is the idea there, because nobody's perfect, but the word there in the Hebrew is, is someone who's mature. The righteousness of the mature, that's the one who's walking in teg- integrity. That's the one who's taken upon the nature and character of Christ. That's the one who's hid the word of God in his heart, who studies the word to implement it. And again, we tell the guys on Monday night, the benefit of studying God's word, it's not in the instruction, it is in the application. The wise man, the mature man, the perfect man or woman, it's mankind, the righteousness of the mature person shall direct his path. Thy word is a light unto my path. It is a lamp unto my feet. It helps me to traverse through the darkness of this world. Amen? That's what God's word does. But the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness because he doesn't have a light to guide. He doesn't have truth to follow. In fact, one of the verses we're learning on Monday night with the men is Joshua 1.8. You know, Joshua was the young man who took over for Moses. And Joshua says in the first chapter of his book, verse 8, he says this, This book of the law shall not depart out of my mouth. So he's quoting it all day long, probably memorizing it. In fact, one of the things we discussed Monday night in in the Old Testament, if you were a young Jewish boy, 
um, at your bar mitzvah, even in the early parts of the New Testament, when you came to your bar mitzvah at 12 years old, when you were moving from childhood to, to adulthood to manhood, you could quote from memory, verbatim, the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. Because Scripture and God's Word was so important to God's people in the Old Testament and should be in the New Testament that David, like I said before, hid God's Word in his heart. Joshua says, this book of the law, and by the way, the book of the law is the first five books of Moses. It's the law of Moses. So Joshua had memorized the first five books of the Bible. This book of the law shall not depart out of my mouth. And then he gives encouragement, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Not only do you study it, but you apply it. You hide it in your heart that it becomes part of your character. It forms your integrity. This book of the law shall not depart out of my mouth, but I shall meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do all uh, that is written therein. And listen carefully. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt be of good success. God promises when you do that, it's going to be a light to your feet, a lamp to your life, it will guide you. And so here, Solomon says, the righteousness of the mature, the person who's hid the word of God in her heart, shall direct his path, but the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness. Verse 6, the righteous, the righteousness of the upright, the person who's walking upright before the Lord, the righteousness of the upright shall deliver them. It stays them. It keeps them from temptation. It keeps them from, from going astray. It keeps them not turning to the left or to the right, but going straight forward in the things of the Lord. But transgressors, those who violate God's law, shall be taken in their own naughtiness. Again, he's talking about truth and integrity, character, hiding the word in your heart, walking in truth, not just studying it, not just the instruction, but the application. Because when you do those kind of things and you allow it to develop the way you think, the way you behave, uh, the places you go, the things you do, it guards you. It is a guard. It, is a, it preserves you. Years ago when I was brand new to the faith, we had this, uh, this evangelist come to the church I was attending. I was a young man and he was from Texas. And I was so intrigued when he taught because he had this Texas accent. And it was pretty thick. And, you know, and I thought it was you know, kind of funny to listen to him because... I mean, and then he was like a down-home boy, and some of his analogies were just down-home, stuff you can wrap your hand around, but he told the story of this West Texas chicken farmer, and he said this chicken farmer was a Christian, he was a man of God, he was a, a follower of Christ, and uh, he had all these chickens that were running around his barnyard, he raised chickens there along with everything else, and he said these chicken hawks would just keep coming, swooping down and stealing away his chickens and the chicks. And so he, he asked the Lord, Lord, what do I do about this? And, he, and the Lord told him, well, you take some of your chicken wire and you form round circles. You know, like eight feet, ten feet. And you set it over the top of the chicken. So that when the chicken hawk swoops down to grab a chicken, he runs into the wire and they are protected. He said, but there was a chick inside that chicken wire that didn't want to stay in that chicken wire because he thought that chicken wire, that thing that the farmer had made for their protection was restrictive. And so he whittled his way out through one of the holes, and then he popped out the other side. He looked back at his friends and began to go neener, 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 until. And I'll never forget what the guy did, because it scared me. He goes, until. And, you know, if you were asleep in that service, you woke up. I was on the front row, and the chicken hawk got him. He says, some of you view God's word as restrictive. And you do your best to wiggle out of it. To get through the cracks and the holes that you might think are in it. That you can get out into the world. He said, but what you don't realize 
Because God's word is not restrictive. It's protective. It protects you from the wicked one who wants to steal, kill, and destroy you. It's a protection. And here we read in Proverbs chapter 11, righteousness of the mature shall direct his way, but the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness. The righteousness of the upright shall deliver them, but the transgressor shall be taken in his own naughtiness. Listen to the next one. When wicked men die, when they die, his expectation shall perish. He is no more. And hope of the unjust men, it's gone. It perishes. The righteous is delivered out of trouble, and the wicked cometh in his stead. God will deliver him out of trouble, and the wicked will come in his stead. Verse 9, very interesting. I think we can get through this one tonight. Uh, I wanted to get to it all. I don't know if I know. Okay, verse 9, listen carefully. This is a good one. You might want to get your toes up. A hypocrite. Anybody know what a hypocrite is? A hypocrite in the Greek is a play actor. You know, um, in those days when on the stage, like with Shakespeare and some of the people, you know, uh, in the old days, they would use these fake faces that they would put on. If you were sad, it would be a face that had a frown. If you were happy, it would be a face that had a smile. And you would put on a mask. And when you put that mask on, you were play acting. The hypocrite, the play actor, um, it says the hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his neighbor. He feigns to be his friend. You know, we were kidding the other day, Pastor Todd in the office. I think it was Pastor Todd in the office. We said, you know, no, I guess it was the guys who went up in the prayer, prayer room. We were kidding before everybody got there on Sunday morning. We were getting ready for everybody to gather up so we could pray for the service up in the prayer room on Sunday morning. And, you know, we were just talking, and uh, somebody said something to one of the guys, hit him a little bit, and he goes, oh, man, you know, you just stabbed me in the back. And uh, I looked at the guy, and he said, well, no, no, he didn't stab you in the back. Your enemy stabs you in the back. Your friends, they stab you in the front. Listen carefully to what he's saying. A hypocrite with his mouth destroys his neighbor. He feigns to be his friend when actually he has ill will toward him. It's what he puts on the mask. But through knowledge shall the just be delivered. Through knowledge shall the just be delivered. God just gives you wisdom, gives you insight. You ever been around somebody and, and they're just, I mean, they're bragging on you, they're flattering you with their lips. Uh, man, they're just telling you what a great friend you are and how, how glad they are that they know you. And Have you ever been around those kind of people? And all of a sudden, it's like the hair on the back of your neck goes up. And you're, you're thinking, man, I mean, they're saying all the right words. But there's something not right here. That's God warning you. You need to listen to the Holy Spirit. That's God warning you. Because the Bible promises us that when those people feign to be your friend and they want to do you harm, that God will expose them if you'll listen carefully to them. Let's just do a couple more. Verse 10, when it goeth well with the righteous, the city rejoices. Now, we've gone into political time here, and some of this is absolutely true. And when the wicked perish, then they're shouting. Now, we don't want the wicked to perish. We want the wicked to get saved, but we want some of them to be gone. Amen? Uh, you know, like Nancy Pelosi, I'm going to tell you, I would do a little shouting if she resigned. 
I'm just going to be honest with you tonight. After what I saw last night, um, well, I'm going to tell you, that was a very wicked thing she did, as far as my opinion. That was very disrespectful. You know, she, she, she feigns, let me, let me, this, this will segue into this. She feigns to be a Christian. In fact, she has said, when she, in fact, she rebuked somebody that said that she hated Trump. She goes, I'm a Christian, and I don't hate anybody. And she put the mask of a Christian on. Because my Bible says we're to pray for those in leadership. And I will tell you this, and God's my witness, when, when uh, President Barack Obama was in office, I did not agree with any of his policies. I was against his, his stand on Israel. I was against his stand on marriage. And I was against his stand on abortion. In fact, I will tell you, I, I didn't vote for him. Because my conscience and my, my faith would not allow me to vote for him. I, and I'll be honest with you, and I might offend some people tonight. I mean, we have 16 satellite churches. We're finding there are people are, are, are reporting in that we, we just found out there's a guy in Colorado that listens and sent me a little note thanking me for just teaching through the Bible. I don't want to offend anybody, but I don't know how today you can be a follower of Christ and vote Democratic. Can I just say that in all sincerity? Can I say that in all sincerity? And I'm not meaning to bash on anybody, but I'm going to tell you, if you think that it's okay for a man to marry a man, that flies in the face of the very institution that God created with one man, one woman. And I'm not saying, because I've seen people in this church that, that came into this fellowship broken and messed up that were in, in homosexuality that repented and God has restored. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't see homosexuality as greater or less than any other sin that we can commit, but it's a sin that has to be repented of. But God's standard is one man, one woman, one lifetime. That's his standard. Uh, if you think it's okay to abort your baby after it's born and it's laying in the delivery room while you're discussing it with your doctor, there's something wrong with you. God judged the nation of Israel because they worshiped Moloch and then worshiping a Moloch, they were aborting their children to that God. He judged the nation for that. And Israel. The Bible said God blesses those who bless Israel and curses those who curse Israel. I have three criteria for me to vote. Number one, what's your stand on Israel? Because I know that God blesses the nation and the people that bless Israel and curses the nation and the people who curse Israel. What do you believe on marriage? Because marriage is a very sacred thing in the eyes of the Lord. He instituted it to be that. And it should be held in the highest esteem and the highest regard. And it's between one man and one woman for one lifetime. And then what, what do you believe about life? Is not life precious? In fact, God says if you shed blood, your blood will be required of you. Murder is a sin. And I'm going to tell you, abortion is murder. I had a man challenge me on this the other day. He said, well, when do you think life begins? Do you think it begins at conception, or do you think it begins when they pump blood, or do you think it begins when they leave the womb? I said, all three of those arguments are false. It begins way before that, because my Bible says that God knew you and he knew me before the foundations of the world. You were in his heart, and you were in his mind. He knew you. In fact, the psalmists tell us that while your pieces and parts were laying around heaven, unassembled, he knew you. In fact, the Bible says in Psalms 91 that your story, your life is a story that's already been told. God knows the beginning from the ending. And you can put a mask on and you can feign Christianity. But if you stand up and you disrespect the president. Now, I prayed for Barack Obama for eight years. I didn't agree with his policies. But I prayed for him because the Bible commands me. Sometimes we'd have prayer meetings here on Wednesday night and we would pray for him. But to stand up and show that kind of disrespect and that kind of hatred is wrong. A hypocrite with his mouth will destroy his neighbor.
But thank God, through knowledge shall the just be delivered. When it goeth well with the righteous, the city rejoices, because righteousness exalts a nation. And when the wicked perish, we shout. By blessing of the upright, the city is exalted, but it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. And we'll end there tonight because I want to give application. I want to spend just one minute giving application. It, how many got to listen last night? I know that ladies had a Bible study here last night, but how many of you men got to listen um, to the State of the Union address? Every one of those things that he said, I've checked them out, is factual. We've never been in a better economy. Unemployment among uh, Africans and Hispanics and even women is down. Um, the economy is cooking. Manufacturing jobs are coming back. Literally, we're being blessed, and it's not because of Trump. It's not because of a man. But it's because of the administration that's in office have said, we're going to pray. We're going to put prayer. Did you listen to the speech when he said, we're not going to muffle the pastors and the preachers? We're going to put prayer back in the school. Abortion is wrong. Righteousness exalts a nation. God's blessing is upon that nation. Now, I'm not telling you that Trump is a perfect Christian by any stretch of the imagination. There are things that he says and there's ways that he acts that I'm not real comfortable with, to be very honest with you. But I know for a fact he's a believer. Because I know for a fact a person that was in the meeting the Sunday that he got saved. And I know for a fact that his vice president is a very godly man. And I know he has surrounded himself with godly men. And here what the Bible says is absolutely true. Look at what's happened to our economy before Trump came in office. And it's not Trump. You can get on a Trump train if you want. I'm on the Jesus train. But I'll tell you, righteousness exalts a nation. God blesses a nation that turns to him, even in our weakness. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from the wicked way, then from heaven would I hear and I would heal their land. We're seeing an opportunity for that to happen. Now, as you looked at that and you see the complexion of the world, what do you think would happen tomorrow if the rapture took place and the church was removed? You know, I don't know that Satan has to do a whole lot. I think he can just leave it to the Democrats and they'll be fine. Now, I, I don't say that because I'm a Republican or a Democrat. Right wing, left wing, sometimes it can be the same bird. I say that because I see what has taken over that party. You know, I, I'm old enough to remember the days of John F. Kennedy. And I remember because I love to listen to inaugural speeches and State of the Union speeches. I don't know. It's one of my things I like to do. I can tell you, since a teenager, I haven't missed any of them. And when John F. Kennedy said, don't ask what your country can do for you, but rather ask what you can do for your country, you tell me things haven't changed in the Democratic Party? I'm just telling you, that righteousness exalts a nation, just like the Bible says it does. And you're going to get an opportunity to exercise your right in just, what, 280 days. Don't vote for a man. Vote for a principle. Vote for righteousness. Amen. Vote for godliness. As much as we can get out of any man. I'm telling you right now, I know that no government is perfect, nor will it ever be when men are running it. I can't wait for the millennial reign of Christ because then things get right. Amen? And I think that's coming around the corner pretty soon. You know, someone told me, man, are you leaving California? No. Well, California stinks. Yeah, it does. Well, it's just full of sin. I said, yeah, but the Bible says where sin abounds, grace abounds the more. Good place to be if you're a preacher of the gospel and you're not ashamed of the word. Good place to be is California. 
got to be salt and light someplace. And I'm going to tell you what, there's a lot of rottenness. And so you don't have to be too salty to have an effect. Amen? This is California. And don't you move until Jesus tells you to move. Because you're salt and light. But righteousness, it salts a nation. You know, as we walk through the Proverbs, the thing that comes to the fore pretty quickly, God is calling us to be his people. To be different from the world. Amen. To live differently, to act differently. To follow precepts and truth that the world has rejected. Amen. May we do that until Jesus comes and takes us out of here. Amen. Let's get the worship team up here and we'll close in a word of prayer. Let's stand this evening. How many verses did I get through? Ten? Eleven? Oh, eleven. Wow, I'm rocking and rolling. Hey, we're going to be here till Jesus comes if I don't pick it up. I had actually studied to do two chapters tonight, and so we'll see. But, hey, it's, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. Let me ask you, how many got convicted tonight as we read through these verses? Anybody? Just two or three of you? The rest of you? Or how many did God reaffirm the things that you're doing in your life that are right? Yeah. Integrity. Character. Hiding his word in your heart. Living in a way... Uh, that God can bless your life. Spend your life on the things of the Lord. Be be eternally minded and not temporal minded. You're going to hear that as we walk all the way through it. And again, I would challenge you to read the proverb of the day. Make that your practice. Tomorrow's the fifth. Read Proverbs chapter five. Ben Carson, by the way, has practiced this almost his whole life. But what he does is he reads the proverb in the morning and then he reads the same proverb again that night he reads it in the morning because he says it settles in on him and he thinks about it through the day and then in the evening he's able to read it again with application so be in the book of wisdom you know God's calling us to be different <coughs> from the world in fact Paul warns us to come out from the world and be separate and don't touch the unclean thing and he'll be our father and we'll be his sons and daughters and he will put his hand of blessing upon us. Amen. How practical the Proverbs are. Father, we thank you for Wednesday nights and for just working through the Proverbs. And, and God, speak to our hearts. It's, the benefit is never just in the instruction. The blessing is in the application. And as James said, help us to be those people that, that look into the perfect law of liberty, into that mirror. And, and to go away and not forget what we have seen. Help us to be those people we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus we ask. And all God's kids would say, Amen. Amen. Hey, let's worship the Lord.